I'm going to warn Bruce. Yeah. I warned Jay. Ta. It's not something you hear. No, 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 no. It's not. Good morning. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Hey, I want to let you know in the. As you make your way back to your pew, we'd ask you to take this time to sign our friendship pads, which are located at the end of each pew, so that we can have a record of who was worshiping with us today. Uh, there is a lot going on in the life of First Presbyterian Church. One thing we want to highlight is our youth dinner and cake auction, which is this Wednesday. Uh, it is the only fundraiser our youth have. Uh, we did this at 8.30 where we polled the congregation to see who was all coming. Almost all the congregation raised their hands. And then we asked who made reservations. <laughs> we need your reservations so that we can know how much food to prepare. And so please, please make your reservations for uh, Wednesday. We're looking forward to that. The youth do an amazing job. The other thing we polled the congregation was how many of the uh, congregation... How many of them drink coffee on Sundays? And it was amazing how many people raised their hands. And then I asked how many people have volunteered to make coffee on Sundays. Again, uh, we are making, the fellowship team needs your help to make coffee. If you could take a week, if you could take two weeks, take a month, that would be great. Again, more information in the bulletin. And then last but not least, next Sunday is Dedication Sunday. This week you will be receiving uh, a letter from Jim Crumley, our chair of stewardship. Please be in prayer about what God is leading you to do in the life of our congregation. And now let's prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls for worship. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. 
I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Let us worship the Lord. As we gather for worship this morning, each one comes into this place bringing our own sin, the guilt and the shame of our sin. We drag it into worship with us, desiring to be reminded of the good news of the gospel, to be unburdened of our sin. And so this is the invitation that God makes to us, that together as the body of Christ and in the silence of our hearts, we would confess our sin But we do so knowing that God's grace is for us, which is why, as the body of Christ, we can pray our prayers of confession with confidence. So let us do so. Eternal God and Redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you. We have not followed your commands. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from our misguided ways so we may choose to obey your will for us to the glory of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Savior. No matter what you have left undone, 
It is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, His life, death, and resurrection, we have been forgiven. This is the gospel, and so believe it and rejoice. Amen.
<laughs> All right. Would the children please come forward and meet me up front for time with the young church? Let's go, let's go, hustle, hustle, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Good job. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Wonderful. You ever heard a whistle in, blown in church before like that? No. Me neither. It hurts your ears. Well, I'll talk to Mr. Jim about that. Uh, I'm sure we'll get emails about it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you guys. Let me tell you about one of my favorite children's stories of all time, my favorite children's books of all time. It's one called Miss Fanny's Hat. Ever heard of it? Anybody ever heard? I know my kids have heard of it. Anybody here know Miss Fanny's Hat? It's a very, it, I, the Baptists love it, okay? Um, Miss Fanny's Hat. Miss Fanny has lots of hats. Each one is her favorite. She's 99 years old. And she's very tiny. In fact, she has grown to be about the size that she was when she was a little girl. Every Sunday, Miss Fanny wears a different hat to church. Her favorite, her most favorite of all, is her famous pink straw hat with roses. That is her absolute favorite hat. One Sunday morning, her pastor asked her if she would consider donating one of her hats to the church for the auction that the church was going to have to raise money for the church. Do you guys know what an auction is? You do? You know what an auction is? An auction is like a sale. You have something that you want people to buy, but instead of just telling them what the price is, you let other people argue who will pay more. And then whoever pays the most wins the item. It's like a game, uh, an auction. Now, the, Miss Fanny's church was going to have an auction to raise money, and her pastor asked her to think about giving a hat, and so she went home and she prayed and asked God to help her decide which hat she should donate. Do you know what hat she decided to donate? The famous pink straw hat with roses. So she trusted God and she gave that hat to her church, and when the time came for it to be auctioned, the pastor said, what am I bid for Miss Fanny's famous hat? Everybody knew this hat because she had worn it to church on Easter Sunday every Easter for the past 35 years. And that hat sold for a lot of money. A lot of money. Uh, it's a really neat story, Miss Fanny's hat. This week, this coming Wednesday, in just a few days, our church is having an auction too. But we're not, we're not selling hats we're selling cakes, that's right, and one loaf of uh, famous sourdough bread, as I understand it. Um, we are raising money for our teenagers and for our families. That's why we're having the, the cake auction on Wednesday, and I really hope that you all will come uh, to this event. When you get to be in, in seventh grade, uh, uh, you get to help at this event, serve dinner and take care of everybody. It's a really fun time together. Miss Fanny and her story reminds us that the church is not a place we go. The church is not this building. The church is us. The church is the people, right? We are the church. And this week at the dinner and cake auction, we all have an opportunity to be the church and to share what we have with others. Isn't that really good news? It's a fun event. I hope you guys and your families uh, will be with us uh, on Wednesday night. Now, will you pray with me? Repeat this prayer with me. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for this day. Thank you for making us part of the church. You love us. We love you. Amen. Thank you, friends, for listening. Good morning. Let us pray together. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
The scripture reading today is from Psalm 147, 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcast of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rains for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning's epistle lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. I invite you to open up your Bibles or the Bibles provided for you as we listen to God's holy word once more. Now hear the words of our Lord. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In Jesus, we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. My friends, these are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we truly give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and to seek your will for our lives. And as we gather in this room made sacred, not by our presence, but by the presence of your Holy Spirit, We pray that your spirit would move us, would shake us, that it would transform us. So open up our minds so that we may feel your love. Open up our hearts so that we can understand your work in this world. Now, O Lord, may the words from my mouth, the meditations from our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As Jim and Tim and Coach Virgil already pointed out, this is the third Sunday of our stewardship season. Now, I've learned a long time ago, as I have pointed out to you before, In many ways, this third Sunday sermon is probably the most important sermon of the whole stewardship campaign, for the very reason that most of you, you've already gotten your pledge card in the mail. Most of you have already prayed about what you would pledge to the the budgetary year coming up. And most of you will already have sealed that pledge card by the time I preach the fourth Sunday sermon on stewardship. So I recognize it is this sermon that is probably more impactful than any other sermon. That being said, as I know that your theme this year is created, connected, and called. Created, connected, and called into the world. And I believe those three words not only help us understand what stewardship is, but what I really hope is that each word is a reminder why every one of us who has heard Jesus call us by name into this world are being called not just to know we're called to be good stewards, but that we are moved in such a way that we want to be good stewards of all the blessings God has bestowed upon us. Stewardship is the genuine desire to actively participate 
in the unfolding work of Jesus in our world. Last two Sundays, we dwelled in the understanding of being created and being connected. It is a reminder that God is solely intentional in all that God does, even when it comes to stewardship. For example, we recognize that we were deliberately created fearfully and wonderfully by divine hand. Meaning God just didn't slap some DNA together, looked at what he did, and walked away. The hymn writer reminds us, as I remind you at every baptism, that God created us in such a way that God knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. God loved us so much, God knew us by name before we were even given a name. Last Sunday, I reminded you that we were created for a purpose. And that purpose is to be connected. And not just connected to the divine, but to be connected to each other. In that story of creation, in the second chapter of Genesis, God created man and placed man in the garden and said to man, all of this is yours. God quickly figured out that if you cannot share the joy with another human being, what good is that? So God created woman. We are reminded in this moment that God calls on us in our creation and in our connection to be together. To be together as a church. And it's not just that we are called to be connected. But the truth is that we are called to show the world what it takes to stay connected. And it takes effort, and it takes prayer, and it takes a whole lot of forgiveness. But we truly are, as a connective body, the hope of this world. This Sunday, we are going to explore what it means, therefore, to be called. When I was growing up in First Presbyterian Church in Dalton, when it was still located in downtown Dalton, there was this beautiful garden that was between the educational and fellowship wing of the church and the sanctuary. As a matter of fact, the only way to get from your Sunday school class to worship was to go through this garden. And and throughout the seasons, it was decorated in the floras of those moments, right? The winter, spring, and summer, and fall, it was always beautiful. And often during the week, you would find church members just sitting in that garden, reading their Bible, reflecting on their faith, Immersing themselves in the beauty. Now, the good news, being good Scottish Presbyterians, is they didn't have to spend much money in the upkeep of this garden because that upkeep, that burden, belonged to one man, Tom Hogshead. Now, i got to be honest with you. When I was growing up, I just thought Tom Hogshead was the yard guy that the church had. But he was actually a ruling elder in the church. And I would later learn he was one of the most prominent doctors in our community. But when he became ordained as a ruling elder in the church, the first thing he did was volunteer to be on the property team. And then he volunteered to build this garden. Tom would get off work at noon on Friday, take off his coat and tie, his white robe that he wore, and put on coveralls. And he headed to his garden. He said he was playing. In Eden. I love that. Playing in Eden. And he was not only there on Friday afternoons, but he spent most of Saturday there too. And soon he wasn't alone because church members, like my mom, would volunteer to play in Eden with him. As a matter of fact, in Dalton, 
there was a man named Henry. Henry wasn't homeless, but he certainly didn't have a home, and he kind of went from couch to couch and relative to relative, and Henry was always famous for asking you for money, even though he probably didn't need money, and one Saturday he asked Tom for money, and Tom said, I didn't bring my wallet, but I'll tell you what, I'll share half of my tomato sandwich I brought for lunch. Tom and Henry sat on the bench, and they ate their tomato sandwiches, And pretty soon, Henry started volunteering in the garden too. And one Sunday, Henry even joined our church. Tom worked in that garden almost the day he died. And he once said, not even specifically related to the garden itself, but he said that when you figure out what you are called to do, It will make your heart sing. When you figure out what you are called to do, it will make your heart sing. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he reminds us that we were not just created and connected so that we could come to church on Sunday and hopefully hear a sermon that's entertaining enough or at the very least doesn't put us to sleep that only lasts an hour in time and then we can leave and go on with our lives not even thinking about church again until Sunday rolls around. Paul says... Our creation and connections were not a means to an end, but a prelude to a divine call. He writes the Ephesians, In Jesus we were chosen, having been predestined according to his plan, working out everything in our lives so that our lives might be in sync with the purpose of his will. And why? Why? Why were we chosen? In order that we who were the first call might place our hope in Christ for the purpose of bringing praise to His glory. Paul is letting us know that we, those who have been created and connected by God are called to live a life that reveals the glory of the one who created us and connected us. Let me just tell you, in previous conversations I've had with believers about being called, so many believers would tell me, I don't know if I've been called or not. So much so that they make the idea of being called complex, almost too complex to grasp, too high for us to obtain. We make the mistake, I believe, of overemphasizing the call with this almost untouchable, unreachable, unattainable spirituality. As if in order to be called, That somehow we have to like experience the very hand of God coming down from heaven and touching our heart or or God standing behind us and whispering into our ears very clearly what God wants us to do. However, according to Paul, this complexity is unwarranted. According to the apostle, being called means finding it in us to serve. To serve in God's kingdom as a reflection of God's glory. When people ask me about my call story, there are times I wish I could tell them that just like God spoke to the prophets of old, God spoke to me as clearly as I'm speaking to you, and God said, John, I want you to be a minister. That didn't happen. Instead, one morning, woke up in my bedroom in Alexandria, Virginia, and I kind of just knew. I kind of knew what I wanted, what I worked for, what I longed for, wasn't what God had in store for me. 
I just knew that the, the direction I was going wasn't the direction God wanted me to go into, so much so that one minute I'm working in Washington, D.C., and the next thing I know, I've enrolled in seminary. A seminary, mind you, that I had never once stepped foot on the campus. I wish I could have been like Moses. After he received the Ten Commandments, you remember God covered up his eyes so he couldn't see the glory of God because it would kill him. But, but then God, as he walked away, allowed Moses to see his backside. That didn't happen for me either. What happened? It's one morning I woke up. And I knew I was standing in holy ground. Paul tells us we were created and connected so that by being called, we might serve God. However, Paul takes our call one step further by saying that it's not that we are called to work for God. Instead, we have to understand we have been called to work with God. Now, to the world, that's not a huge difference, right? To work for or work with, but for us, it is all the difference in the world. This is what Paul means when he tells us that by the the will of God, we are heirs. We have inherited what Jesus started on this earth. This is why I tell you almost every Sunday, we, we have the privilege of continuing the good work of Jesus until he comes again. Bobby reinforces his point when he speaks to us about mission. Mission, he tells us, is not taking Jesus into the world. Jesus is already into the world. Mission is for us to leave this place seeking out what Jesus is doing. And when we find what Jesus is doing, humbly asking if we can participate with him. God created and connected us for this purpose, for God's purpose. And in living into our God call, God's purpose becomes our purpose. When Jesus called Peter and James and John to be fishers of men, they left everything they had because they made God's purpose their purpose. Luke left his practice as a doctor just to be the physician of Paul. And when that was over, He wrote a gospel, and when that was over, he wrote the history of the church because God's purpose became his purpose. I'm not sure when Tom Hogshead joined First Presbyterian Church as a young doctor, he knew that his call was to start this garden and much, much more. But over time and with joy, he figured it out. God's purpose became his purpose. This is what Paul is getting at when he reminds us that we are endowed with talents and gifts and skills for this purpose. Therefore, our call centers around what we love to do the most. It centers around our strengths. If I were to pull the choir, I guarantee you there is not one choir member who would say, you know, I really don't like singing. It's just not my thing. Don't like it. Don't like it at all. Or our care team. I would be stunned if there is anyone on our care team who says, you know, I really don't like people. People are the worst. We do what we do because God created us to do it. Even in my own call. As a child who, who struggled with dyslexia, couldn't even write down his thoughts on paper. But he could talk. Sometimes he could talk way too much. Is it any wonder that God would ask me to stand behind this pulpit and tell you what I'm thinking? 
making God's purpose my purpose. What do you love? What brings you joy? What makes your heart sing? What has God asked you to do for this church and for our community and for our world? Now here it is. I can't tell you what that is. We can talk about it. We can pray about it. But in the end, it's between you and God. But I promise you this, when you figure it out, when you finally figure it out, It will make your heart sing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, so be it. Amen. Our dear friends, like the saints who have gone before us, let us stand and confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Now, my friends, let us continue our time in worship by giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
Heavenly Father and gracious God, we truly believe all good gifts have come from your hand. So we pray, O Lord, that you would grant us the strength and courage to continue the good work of your Son till he comes again. For it is in his holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our reality as a church is that nowhere do we better understand this notion of being created and connected and called than the table. For this truly is where our stewardship begins. Let us prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls to receive the Lord's Supper. Lord be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give our thanks and praise God it is indeed right that we give you our thanks and our praise as we consider the ways in which we might return some of the gifts you have given us we give you thanks for this table this place that we may come no matter who we are be welcomed by you Receive your grace and strengthened in both body and soul to love you and to love others well. And so we pray that as we come to the table of your son, Jesus Christ, this morning, that you would meet us here, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these gifts, that this would truly be communion in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, by your grace, as we eat and drink, draw us deeper into your heart and deeper into your love that we might love one another more deeply, that we might love others more deeply until you return or call us home, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. According to the gospel on the night of our Lord's betrayal, in an upper room with those he loved the most, his disciples, he took common bread and having blessed it, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said to his disciples and friends, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which has been poured out for you, for you, and for you. Drink of it, everyone. My beloved, I tell you the truth. Whenever we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. So I invite you to come. All who've heard Jesus call you by name into this world, come and drink and eat and know grace and mercy. For this, this is not a Presbyterian table. It doesn't even belong to us. This, this is the Lord's table. And all are welcome.
All right. You who were first called, you are heirs of the good work that was started by Jesus. And the work you do reflects on me. The work you do, you do for me. Pray with me. O Heavenly Father and gracious God, your love for us is so evident. And the knowledge that you took your time with creation, you took your time with us. And we humbly admit we are your most beloved creation because we're the only thing in creation that was created in your image. And so as we leave this place, may we do so, knowing that we work with you to bring forth your kingdom into this world. So we humbly pray, That when the world sees us, they will see your Son. We pray that when we see the world, we will see him too. We boldly pray the prayer he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
My beloved, remember your baptism. God knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. God knew us by name before we were even given a name. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's the hope of this world. So go and go with God and go in peace. And may God be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Go in peace.